here. I'm, I'm trying to help you. Why don't you trust me? You can't trust somebody when they think you're crazy. The late 90s brought a wave of successful Japanese horror films reflecting societal issues that were filled with creeping dread and scares that hold up decades later. Written by Sebastian Gutierrez and directed by Matthew Kasovitz, Gothica incorporated aspects of the J-horror movement to varying degrees of success, with a film I think prioritizes concept over story. It follows Halle Berry's Dr. Miranda Gray, a psychiatrist at Woodward Penitentiary that is about to have the worst day imaginable. After leaving the facility on what was a normal workday, a sinkhole sends her on a detour that leads to a profound supernatural encounter. She swerves to avoid hitting a young woman standing in the middle, revealed to be a spectre that possesses her. Unbeknownst to Miranda at the time, the apparition is Rachel, the daughter of her superior that allegedly ended her life years before. But in true spooky fashion, everything is not as it seems. Because you're crazy. And the more you try to prove them wrong, the crazier you appear. You are invisible now. Can you feel it? After regaining consciousness, she awakens to find her entire world has been turned upside down. She is now a patient at her own facility, and her co-workers regard her as another crazed person with a broken mind. No doubt with the same detachment she bestowed upon her own patients. All I know is I saw this girl, and she's connected to me. How? I don't know how she's connected to me. Don't run all your psychiatric shit to me! Much to her horror, Dr. Pete Graham, her co-worker, informs her that she is the primary suspect in the brutal death of her husband, head doctor of Woodward, Dr. Douglas S. Gray, an act that she has no recollection of. While Miranda copes with her new life, the ghost takes control over her body to deliver messages, including carving the words not alone into her arm, leading the staff to believe that Miranda is trying to end her life. Despite the horrific circumstances, she bonds with fellow inmate and, importantly, former patient Chloe Sava. In many sessions, Chloe had declared that she had been attacked by the devil, but not doing her due diligence, Miranda had shrugged off these claims, attributing them to delusions of mental illness. You have no idea how it feels not to be trusted. You've got to trust me too, Chloe. You can't trust someone who thinks you're crazy. Miranda is now in a similar situation, with nobody believing her story, but it's not until the ghost possessing her recreates the events that Chloe spoke of that she realizes she'd made a grave mistake. To her shock, not only is the attacker on the loose, but as her memories begin to come back, Miranda realizes that she did indeed kill Douglas, but not in the way everyone thought. The ghost had essentially hijacked her body and committed the deed, but Miranda is still unsure why. I'm not deluded, Pete. I'm possessed. I don't believe in ghosts. Neither do I. But they believe in me. Wanting answers, she breaks out and goes to a farmhouse in Willow Creek, Rhode Island, and discovers a room with bloodstains, drugs, restraints, and video equipment. Watching the tape that was still in the camera, she sees Douglas commit a heinous murder as the police arrive. Miranda backs up to a staircase when an injured girl grabs hold of her arm from the adjoining crawl space. The police release the girl, but Miranda is taken to jail, where Sheriff Ryan, her husband's best friend, interrogates her on how she knew all of these things. Ryan contends that he does not believe her claim that ghosts had told her, and asks what sort of person the accomplice could be. And so, Miranda gives a psychological profile on the accomplice that's still on the loose. In doing so, realizing that Ryan fits the profile perfectly, he attacks her, but Miranda and Rachel manage to kill him. Due to the troubling circumstances surrounding her husband and the sheriff, Miranda is released. Horrifically, after she and Chloe discuss overcoming their experiences, Miranda sees a young boy standing in the middle of the road that's about to be hit by a truck. She yells at him to move, but after the truck passes through the boy without harming him, she realizes he was also a ghost. The experience with Rachel has in some way enhanced Miranda's sensory perception, giving her a new sense, one more than the five we already have. As she walks away, a poster with the words, Have you seen Tim? and a picture of the same boy shown next to the street Miranda is walking on. The ending implies that he too is a spirit looking for someone to hear his story and bring his killer to justice, but doesn't acknowledge whether she'll be helping him, which I thought was a missed opportunity to give her some agency in what happens next. It feels more like she has this curse now and won't be helping anyone after what Rachel did to her. The film was a commercial success, but critically panned. People for the most part praised Halle Berry for her performance and Kasovitz's direction, but thought the plot was ridiculous and dialogue horrendous. Logic is overrated. Only stupid people say that. 
Perhaps something like, there are some things beyond the realm of our understanding, anything that's poignant and ties into Miranda's journey. But to have the main character, and a psychiatrist no less, who has just gone through a harrowing experience say, logic is overrated, is a combination of character assassination and justification for the scriptwriter's inadequacies. Sebastian Gutierrez would go on to write Snakes on a Plane, another awfully scripted thriller that is saved by Samuel L. Jackson as an FBI agent that has to take on a plane full of deadly venomous snakes to save a witness. I have had it with these monkey fighting snakes on this Monday to Friday plane! The genius of Snakes on a Plane, if I can call it that, is that its director David R. Ellis, a former stunt coordinator turned director, had fun with it. He didn't take it too seriously, and we had Samuel L. having the time of his life. Everybody strap in! About to open some fucking windows. But when you're dealing with such heavy subject matter, you can't afford to be careless. There was an interesting discussion I thought brewing on the way mental health is dealt with and the notion of evil, with Douglas proclaiming that he was God. Several characters in need are betrayed by the system, either by the medical institutions or police that were supposed to protect them. But the story doesn't resolve these things in any meaningful way than to say that life sucks and you're on your own till you die, after which you can possess an innocent person and torment their life to undo a wrong. It's pretty nihilistic when you think about it, but I guess Sebastian doesn't really want us to do much thinking. Logic is overrated. I mean, Rachel literally abuses and manipulates Miranda into helping her. She possesses her body and puts her through a type of hell that Miranda might not have been able to recover from, which sort of made me wonder why the ghost didn't just possess Douglas, you know, the person that killed her, torment him for what he had done to so many innocents before getting him to kill himself. And then, you know, make a thriller about Miranda trying to prove that Douglas didn't kill himself and have her stumble onto the revelation that he was in fact evil. You can still have her hunt down the sheriff, make everyone think that she's crazy, but where is the logic in having Rachel subject her to the same cruelty that she had suffered? Logic is overrated. We're supposed to sympathize with Rachel, and we do to a point, of course, but that is limited by the fact that she is a vengeful abuser. My other major gripe is that Miranda doesn't have much agency in the story because she isn't in control for most of the important things she does, like killing her husband and even the sheriff, which Rachel is mostly responsible for. She didn't even work it out on her own. Everything is spelled out for her, and Ryan practically told her he was the accomplice during the interrogation. The occasionally terrible dialogue is juxtaposed with some really inventive shots, but I guess my point is that while Kasovitz was really passionate about Japanese horror and put a lot of creativity and thought into how the story would be told, he was held back by a focus on concept over substance. As a result, Gothica is a muddled supernatural thriller. Well, that's all for today, folks. Thanks to everyone who requested we take a look at Gothica. If you want us to cover snakes on a plane soon, let me know in the comments below. As always, it's been a pleasure. Niat here with Film Comics Explained. Thanks for stopping by. That's good news. Snakes on crack.